As the mystery of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, the Boeing 777 bound for Beijing that vanished seemingly without a trace, approaches the two-week mark, the talking heads of the corporate news networks are becoming increasingly desperate to fill the 24-7 news cycle with meaningless speculation and blather. In their desperation, they have even turned to speculation on a subject long shunned as outlandish conspiracy theory by these very same networks, the possibility of remote control hijackings of commercial passenger jets. The latest theory is the flight could have fallen victim to the world's first cyber hijack. In an interview with the UK's Sunday Express, Dr Sally Leversley, a former Home Office scientific advisor, said she believed malicious codes triggered by a mobile phone or a USB stick could have been able to override the aircraft's security system. This could then change the plane's speed, altitude and direction by sending radio signals to its flight management system. In April last year, Hugo Tesso, a security consultant described how aircraft hacking was possible during a lecture at a computer hacking conference. The speculation is prompted in part by a report in the Federal Register last November noting that several models of 777, including the 777-200 model used for Flight 370, were susceptible to outside attack. Question mark headlines musing about the possibility of such a cyber hijacking serve to obscure or even deny a very important point. The first such cyber hijackings most likely took place over 12 years ago, on September 11, 2001, using technology that was tested, proven, and available long before that infamous date. Although unmanned aerial vehicles, or UAV, like the Global Hawk, Predator, and Reaper drones used in the US's illegal extrajudicial assassination program are thought of as cutting-edge military hardware, UAVs of various sorts have been used since August 22, 1849, when Austria launched 200 pilotless, bomb-filled balloons on the city of Venice. Development of UAVs continued with radio-controlled drones and pilotless torpedoes developed in World War I, the creation of the U.S. Air Force's pilotless aircraft branch in 1946, the deployment of military UAVs in the Vietnam War, Israel's development of the first drone with real-time surveillance capabilities in the Yom Kippur War, and U.S. use of the technology in Grenada before the birth of the modern era with the extensive deployment of pioneer drones in the first Gulf War. When it comes to the remote control of civilian aircraft, President Bush stated in late September 2001 that he would devote federal funds to developing new technologies for combating the threat of hijacking, including remote control technology. And we will look at all kinds of technologies to make sure that our airlines are safe, and for example, including technology to enable controllers to take over distressed aircraft and land it by remote control. But even at that time, remote control technology had been successfully demonstrated for commercial jetliners for nearly two decades. This is actual footage of a joint NASA-FAA experiment conducted in 1984 at Edwards Air Force Base, in which a Boeing 720 was remote controlled through multiple takeoffs and landings before being crashed in a controlled impact demonstration. In August of 2001, this technology was further demonstrated by Raytheon, which successfully took off and landed a Boeing 727 six times at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico without a pilot on board. Raytheon also developed a sensor suite for the Air Force's Global Hawk drones, and Raytheon Network Centric Systems has recently won multiple contracts to help develop advanced communication systems for the E-4B, the U.S. government's so-called doomsday plane that was spotted above the White House shortly before the strike on the Pentagon, and which has since been confirmed was one of four functioning doomsday planes operating in the skies on that day. It appeared overhead just before 10 a.m., a a four-engine jet banking slowly in the nation's most off-limits airspace, on the White House grounds and the rooftop, a nervous scramble. About 10 minutes ago, there was a white jet circling overhead. Now, you generally don't see planes in the area over the White House. That is restricted airspace. No reason to believe that this jet was there for any nefarious purposes, but the Secret Service was very concerned, pointing up at the jet in the sky. And still today, no one will offer an official explanation of what we saw. Two government sources familiar with the incident tell CNN it was a military aircraft and say the details are classified. This comparison of the CNN video and an official Air Force photo suggests the mystery plane is among the military's most sensitive aircraft, an Air Force E-4B. Note the flag on the tail, 
the stripe around the fuselage, and the telltale bubble just behind the 747 cockpit area. Curiously, on 9-11 itself, Raytheon employees with ties to the company's Electronic Warfare Division, including a man described as the company's Dean of Electronic Warfare and multiple senior engineers for electronic systems, were among the listed passengers on each of the three planes that hit their targets that day. Raytheon also had an office in WTC2 on the 91st floor, and despite the fact that there were only four survivors from the Twin Towers who were above the impact zone at the time of the plane hits, no Raytheon employees died in the office that day. Another curious connection presents itself in Dov Zakheim, the comptroller of the Bush Pentagon and, until taking over his Pentagon role in 2001, CEO of SPC International, a subsidiary of System Planning Corporation, which provides a so-called flight termination system for the U.S. military that the company boasts provides a fully redundant turnkey range safety and test system for remote control and flight termination of airborne test vehicles. As comptroller of the Pentagon, Zakheim was responsible for the trillions of dollars that could not be accounted for in the Pentagon's books at the time of 9-11, and which prompted Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld to declare a war on bureaucracy on September 10th, 2001. Pentagon, the day before 9-1-1, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld declared war, not on foreign terrorists. The adversary is closer to home. It's the Pentagon bureaucracy. He said money wasted by the military poses a serious threat. In fact, it could be said that it's a matter of life and death. Rumsfeld promised change, but the next day, the world changed. <laughs> and in the rush to fund the war on terrorism, the war on waste seems to have been forgotten. My 03 budget calls for more than $48 billion in new defense spending. More money for the Pentagon when its own auditors admit the military cannot account for 25% of what it already spends. According to some estimates, we cannot track $2.3 trillion in transactions. Flight 77 was supposedly piloted by Hani Honjur, a flight school dropout who could not handle a Cessna 172, but somehow managed to steer a 757 in an 8,000-foot descending 270-degree corkscrew turn at 500 miles per hour to come exactly level with the ground. Neither experienced pilots nor aviation officials could believe that such a move could be pulled off with such precision at such high speeds by any but the most experienced pilot. Watching the flight on her radar screen, Dulles International Airport air traffic controller later remarked, The speed the maneuverability, the way that he turned, we all thought in the radar room, all of us experienced air traffic controllers, that that was a military plane. By what we are expected to believe is a massive coincidence, the flight ended up hitting the Pentagon in the budget analyst office where the DOD staffers overseen by Zakheim were working on the question of the missing trillions. This is a picture of the location of the victims of the Pentagon attack that was released as part of the prosecution exhibits at the trial of Zacharias Musawi. It depicts the offices that were destroyed in the attack, including the office of Resource Services Washington, a team of 65 civilian accountants, bookkeepers, and budget analysts, 34 of whom died on September 11, 2001. As a Pittsburgh Post-Gazette article of December 20, 2001 noted, Robert Jaworski, the director of the office, was faced with the task of choosing which of his colleagues' funerals he would attend because he could not physically attend them all. The office's role in processing information regarding the unaccounted for $2.3 trillion has never been established by outside researchers and in fact has never even been inquired into by professional journalists. An Arlington County After Action report on the rescue and cleanup response at the Pe Pentagon, however, notes that, quote, it was also the end of the fiscal year and important budget information was in the damaged area. As 9-11 researcher Aidan Monahan told the Corbett Report in 2011, the remote control hypothesis also makes sense of various anomalies in the flight path of United 175 that hit World Trade Center 2. Well, there are many video clips of uh, United Airlines Flight 175 striking World Trade Center Building 2 on September 11. And there was one in particular I noticed when looking around at different clips that captures most of the last 13 seconds of the flight of United 175 as it approached World Trade Center 2. And in fact, it does capture virtually all of the last eight seconds. And what I noticed during this clip was as the 
the plane approached and the angle of the camera was such that you could actually see the angle of the, uh, the, the bank angle of the aircraft with respect to its location, uh, with respect to the building as it was approaching. It just was a very ideal almost type of shot. And uh, what one can notice is that uh, the plane uh, begins its banked 20 degree turn about a mile and a half from the building and without correction would have been able to strike the building from that distance, which is, in my opinion, a, a rather remarkable feat for an untrained pilot. What it does require is the precise coordination of at least two factors, the selection of a correct bank angle from the given location from where you are making this turn and also traveling at a rate of 799 feet per second the initiation of this turn at the precisely correct time because the turn that we observe had it began had it started rather a second sooner even or later than observed means the plane misses the building by 799 feet necessarily and in my view possibly suggested the role of uh, flight control computers or other avionics and autopilot systems as opposed to the unproven allegation of hijacker pilots in control of these airplanes. As incredible as such a narrative is to the general public, that incredibility stems largely from the media's steadfast refusal to report on the proven technologies to accomplish such a cyber hijacking that have been available for well over a decade. Whether or not Flight 370 was the victim of such an attack, or something different altogether, remains to be seen. But the many pieces of the 9-11 puzzle pointing to the use of remote-controlled technologies to pilot the flights on that fateful day from Raytheon's test flights of remote-controlled passenger jets, to Zakheim's involvement with a company responsible for remote control flight termination systems, to the precision of United 175's bank angle and turn start time, to the presence of the E-4B doomsday planes in the skies that morning, provide a compelling counter-narrative to the tabloid press's claim that Flight 370 may be the first example of cyber hijacking. One other piece of that puzzle provides yet further credence to the claim of remote control planes on 9-11. In a story so bizarre that it simply cannot be shoehorned into the official 9-11 story, and thus has been ignored, police officers stopped a strange van near their temporary command post next to the still-smoldering Twin Towers while the chaos unfolded on the morning of 9-11. According to the official report of the Mineta Transportation Institute, there were continuing moments of alarm. A panel truck with a painting of a plane flying into the World Trade Center was stopped near the temporary command post. It proved to be rented to a group of ethnic Middle Eastern people who did not speak English. Fearing that it might be a truck bomb, the NYPD immediately evacuated the area, called out the bomb squad, and detained the occupants until a thorough search was made. The vehicle was found to be an innocent delivery truck. No explanation of who these men were or why they had a picture of a remote-controlled jet flying into the World Trade Center painted on their delivery van on the morning of 9-11 have ever been provided, much less even asked for by the complacent, complicit mainstream media. If and when more details of the missing Malaysian Airlines flight do eventually surface, don't expect the media to do any better job answering questions about it or connecting any of the 9-11 dots in what may very well have been the world's first cyber hijacking nearly 13 years ago. This video is brought to you by the subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information on this and other topics, please go to BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information and commentary from James Corbett, please go to CorbettReport.com.